has a passion for storytelling, has written three novels, and tonight she's going to read from her most recent book, Beauty and Grace. And here's what one reviewer said. Beauty and Grace touched me personally. The author's amazing storytelling through twists and turns means you'll find it hard to put this book down without knowing what awaits at the next turn of the page. Please welcome Christina Hatt. and Charles both. It's my honor to be invited an invited member of tonight's Arts Without Wall Showcase and to share with you my newest book, Beauty and Grace. This book is a work of historical fiction based on a story shared with me by a woman named Mary Jo Hodge. Mary Jo was once the chief of mental health treatment services at the Gowanda Psychiatric Institute, which is located about 25 miles south of Buffalo, which is my hometown. In her job, Mary Jo worked closely with nurses on that staff, some of whom had been there for two decades or longer. These nurses often shared stories about their interactions with some of their patients, immigrant women, many of whom had come from, migrated from Ireland, unmarried and not meeting a man to marry. Rather, they had their own dreams for a new life in America. According to these women, when they were processed through Ellis Island and stated that they were unmarried and not needing a man to marry, the United States government deemed them financial liabilities and immediately had them institutionalized despite the fact that they were of sound mind and body. Sadly, some of them remained locked away for the rest of their days. Beauty and Grace spans the time of the early to late 20th century. It is the story of 12 women and three men institutionalized during this time in our nation's history. The 15 span the time, span the realm from immigrants to American citizens, most of whom were unjustly locked away for the greater portion of their lives. While they are fictionalized characters, their diagnosis, treatments and mistreatments at the hands of the American medical and mental health community are based on two years of research and interviews that I conducted online and in person. Tonight, I'm going to share with you the introduction to Beauty and Grace. It takes place in Ireland, where you are about to meet one of the two main characters in this book, Tegan Cormack, who is based directly on the immigrant women for whom Mary Jo Hodge and her nurses once cared. June 25th, 1928. The morning air lay thick with layered orders of fish, seaweed, and bilge seeping from the nearby moored ships. The briny smells weaved into every bit of life growing up in the oceanside village of Queenston, County Cork. My family's heritage was woven through a long line of Irish seafarers, tracing back to the first century life of St. Brendan the Navigator. As me da was forever saying, never forget me, darling girl. The salt water runs through your veins. Truth be told, I was always looking for ways to be on the docks, whether bringing lunch to me da at a shipyard job, skipping school for my passion and painting seascapes along the rocky coast, or escaping me bed from midnight communion with the endless shoreline of stars. Me soul was always being pulled by the tides. Twas me deepest dream to one day cross the ocean to America. Not that I was wanting to leave behind me family, mind you. More, I was wishing to follow the path of Bridget Hanlon, the sister of me best friend, Margaret Mary. Bridget was a poet, celebrated within Queenston for her work, oft published in the Church Bulletin, and every now and then in the Examiner newspaper. Everyone said she was born to follow in the footsteps of Corp's own Mary Ellen Patrick Downing, whose poems were featured in Dublin's Irish Nationalist newspaper. Oh, but Bridget, she had a greater dream. One she shared with me and Margaret Mary one Sunday after our families come home from church. Truth be told, Bridget didn't exactly mean to be sharing her dream. It was only on account of me and Margaret Mary coming upon her and Patrick Mahoney kissing in the alley back behind where he lived. 
We was always being thorns in Bridget's side, sneaking around and spying on her. We did it because she always gave us something good to stop us from telling what we knew. No doubt the kiss was big news. And me and Margaret Mary was beyond excited over what treasure Bridget might be offering for our silence. I've not a sweet nor a nickel to be given the two of you little devils. And I've not a care what you'd be telling anyone about me and Patrick. It makes no never mind, as I've got me bag right here. And the two of us are leaving straight away for America. The newspaper editor there wants to hire me to write, and that's just what I'm going to do. But if you promise not to tell till I'm gone, you can have me lace hanky that Nanny embroidered for me. Pushing the delicate lace and linen square into my hand, Bridget gave a quick kiss and a hug to her sister, and off she went. Margaret Mary started falling on the spot. So as I give her the hanky to dry her face and wipe her nose, it was only a few minutes before her temper replaced her tears. I only have to share a bed with one sister now, so good riddance. She was nothing but trouble around here anyhow. Seeing how Margaret Mary was in a mind to tattle, I asked if she wanted to sneak off to the harbor to watch Bridget board the ship. I was hoping to do just the same one day, so as I could become a famous painter in America. The thing was, I was in need of a bit of courage. <coughs> Me hope was by watching someone else take the steps, I'd be able to do the same. So as off we went and watched, and we made a pact never to tell all we knew about Bridget kissing or her leaving. As for me, I made me own pact. That come a year's time, I'd go board a ship leaving behind Ireland's green shores for America's gold paved streets, don't you know? As fate would have it, in a few months' time, a handbill was posted on the wire fence surrounding the shipyard. I first noticed the artwork across the top. It was a design I knew by heart. The red flag with a white star belonged to one of the finest shipping lines in the world. Yet the bold words below were what I cared most about. RMS Olympic sails to America. Being the daughter of a shipbuilder, I knew the names and histories of most vessels come to port. The Olympic was the sister ship to the Titanic. Itself sailed from Queenston, April 10, 1912, never to return. Ever since, no matter when the Olympic come to port, I was sure to be there to see it. It was a never-ending thrill to see the grand ship glide into the harbor, watching wealthy first-class and steerage-class Irish being ferried and gangplank. When I saw the listed sail dates on the hand, tail dates on the handbill, I set my heart on the final one and went to making a plan. I started work sweeping floors at O'Brien's Market and keeping every bit of me wages in a leather satchel it made the mattress I shared with me three sisters. As months passed, I saved enough for me ticket and the new birthday I'd been needing to buy from a bootlegger along the docks. As being only 16, Irish immigration who regarded me not legal to be traveling on me own. I also went to squirreling away a bit of food from the larder each week and packing a small satchel so his man didn't miss a few of me clothes here and there in wash days. I made sure as well to pack up me rosary, me drawing pads and pencils, and me best sketch of the harbor, so as I'd never forget from where I come. As the time for leaving drew near, the excitement of starting a new life began bubbling up within me. I knew the only way to ever leave me family would be without work or hug. Still, I needed to tell someone before I burst. Margaret Mary was the only choice. Are you daft, girl? You're not but 16 and certainly not smart enough to go off on your own. At least Bridget had the good sense to sail away with Patrick and knowing that when she got to America, she had a job. I'll tell you straight, from what Patrick's family is here, life in America ain't the crack. In fact, I heard Patrick's dad telling there's people dying across that ocean in the lower parts of ships. Irish like us being proud to tight one another in small spaces making all of them sweaty and smelly no better than animals. And mind you, if they manage to survive the voyage, they're being forced to work in buildings with little light and not enough air to breathe for most all hours of the day. And one more thing about going on your own. 
What's to keep you safe from any harm? Margaret Mary's words flamed me temper. They also left me thinking about going away from the only life I'd known and maybe never returning. Just the same, my heart was driven by waves of wanderlust. Surely the same that sent my granddad to worldly sailing adventures at a youthful 13. No matter the fears and home back these in my heart, there's no denying the call of the tides on my soul. So it was one foggy morning. Disguised to me by the queen's clothes, and me gauze woolen cap, I stole up the hook as I left out the back door. I made me way up the Olympic as 18 year old, paler, eager. Ma'am often told the story of my birth and how Dawes straight away named me Tegan, the Irish word for beauty. Not wanting to ever lose that connection, I'd heard tell American school head teacher Annie Edison Taylor. First to go over the world's natural wonder in Niagara Falls in a barrel. Her story helped me make up my mind to take the tea from me name, the Taylor, and believe in Egan for the rest. As I made my way down the ship's stairs to third class, I managed to weave into a small space of a bunk bed. There I wormed among five women and their six babies, gathering me such a little close to my chest. I shut my eyes and dreamed of all that lie ahead. And as I did, I said a silent prayer to Mary, Mother of God. Let me new life in America not end up in a miserable place with little light and not enough air and where I'd be forced to be for all the rest of